This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, welcome to today's Wetzel Westcott Dimmick Lecture. Uh, the, West, the Wetzel Westcott Dimmick Lectureship, established with funds donated by supporters and friends of Cornell, honors three great Cornell plant pathologists of the past Herbert Heiss Wessel, Cynthia Westcott, and A.W. Watt Dimmick. Wetzel was an American pioneer in, in mycology and plant pathology and the first chair of the Cornell Department of Plant Pathology. Westcott was the nation's first practicing plant doctor and the author of many popular garden books. Dimmick was a pioneer in the health of floriculture crops and the development of growth rooms for research. To enhance the community of scholars in plant pathology and related disciplines, eminent Wetzel Westcott Dimmick lecturers are brought to Cornell each year. Today's eminent lecturer, Greg Martin, did not have to travel far because he is the Boyce, the Boyce Schultz Downey uh, Professor at uh, Boyce Thompson Institute, and he has a joint appointment as a professor in the uh, SIPS section of plant pathology and plant microbiology. Uh, Greg received his PhD in, uh, in genetics from Michigan State in 1989, and then came to Cornell for a three-year postdoctoral fellowship in Steve Tagsley lab uh, in plant breeding. He launched his own lab at per Purdue in 1992 and then returned to Ithaca in 1998 in his uh, joint BTI uh, uh, appointment uh, for his career here. Greg's interest in plant microbe interactions began with his work at Michigan State on common bean and the nitrogen fixing symbiont Bradyrhizobium japonicum. But after Michigan, he shifted to tomato and Pseudomonas syringi, Pseudomonas syringi pathobar tomato, which causes bacterial speck disease. More specifically, Greg was interested in the molecular basis for the <clears throat> gene for gene interactions uh, in this pathosystem. <clears throat> Uh, the widespread phenomenon of gene-for-gene -gene resistance, typically involving a single plant resistance gene and a matching pathogen avirulence gene, has been demonstrated with flax cultivars and rust fungus races in the 1940s. In the mid-1980s, avirulence genes began to be cloned from P. syringi pathovars and other bacterial pathogens. But their properties remained, uh, provided little clue to what they were doing. Thus, Greg launched his lab in 1992 with the field facing two giant questions. First, what was the biochemical basis for the genetically defined phenomenon of gene for gene resistance? And second, why did pathogens produce a virulence proteins, which by definition doomed them in certain varieties of a host? Greg's work began with a 1993 cloning of the first plant gene conferring gene for gene resistance and the bombshell revelation of its encoded protein. He then continued with a series of fundamental discoveries that played a central role in elucidating the now textbook paradigm of the two-tiered innate immune system of higher plants. Importantly, the tomato pseudomonas syringi molecular interaction model provided the first fully developed and now canonical illustration of the plant innate immune system in coevolutionary dynamic interaction with a pathogen. Did you get that? <laughs> we're, we're talking, 
We're talking things that are going to be in textbooks 100 years from now. Uh, for his broad scientific impact, Greg has received many honors, uh, <clears throat> including the Noel Keen Award for Excellence in Molecular Plant Pathology. Uh, he's a fellow of the uh, American Academy of Microbiology, uh, AAAS, and in 2022, uh, Greg was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. But Greg's local impact also warrants recognition. I will note just two examples. First, in his 22 years here, Greg's lab has hosted 87 Cornell undergraduates, 11 of whom completed senior honors projects. Second, during this period, Greg has had co-authorship level collaborations with over 20 Cornell, BTI, and ARS professor scientists. As one of those collaborators, I had an inside view of Greg's impeccable standards for research quality, the clarity of his thinking, his fundamental decency, and something else uh, that it took me quite a while to put my finger on. And that is his ability to see the best and thereby bring out the best in all of us. So I offer a collective thanks to Greg for that. And with that, I invite Greg to the podium for his lecture. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Ellen, for that very nice and thorough introduction. It means a lot to me that uh, to have you here today and to, and to introduce me. Uh, yeah, it was just great collaborating with you for over 20 years, and it was certainly a big impact on my career that that happened that way. So thanks, everyone, for, for coming today. Um, I'm looking forward to telling you about what my lab has been working on for the last 30 years. I calculated I have about uh, a minute and a half per year, so <laughs> I'm not really going to try to do I'm not going to try to be comprehensive like that, but I am honored to give this talk uh, recognizing the legacy of Wetzel, uh, Westcott, and Dimmick. And I actually did a little bit of reading about them before I gave this talk. I have introduced uh, WWD speakers myself, but I hadn't read as much into them as maybe I should have. And I learned some interesting things. One thing I learned was that uh, Westcott, or sorry, Wetzel, was actually uh, knew uh, William Boyce Thompson back 100 years ago, back in 1924. And he actually worked hard to convince uh, William Boyce Thompson to move his new institute here to the Cornell campus. But as it says here, Thompson wanted to be personally involved. And so the institute was built across the street from his mansion in Yonkers, New York. And the story goes that he would get up in the morning and make a cup of coffee and basically wander through the lab and ask people what they had discovered yesterday. So, so a little bit of pressure. So I think we all know that BTI established its international reputation in Yonkers and then moved uh, to the Cornell campus in 1974. And this year we're celebrating our 100th anniversary. So I, I think perhaps uh, Wetzel uh, planted the seed back 50 years before we moved for the Institute actually to move here. And it might be part of the reason that I'm standing here today because the Institute of course is here on campus. So because this is a retrospective sort of seminar, I wanted to show just two slides and about what inspired me initially to get into uh, plant sciences and in particular plant microbiology. And Alan has alluded to this a little bit. I think uh, many of you, of course, will know that Liberty Hyde Bailey was the first dean of the College of Agriculture here at Cornell. His portrait is there in the back of the room. This is his portrait. Um, he was really influential here at Cornell. He started the College of Agriculture. I actually read that he hired Wetzel in, in 1905. So he had a huge impact on the College of Agriculture, but also on Cornell. He also, looking back on it, had a pretty big impact on me. Before he came to Cornell, uh, Liberty Hyde Bailey was a professor at Michigan Agricultural College, now Michigan State University. And he was kind of a local celebrity and, of course, later a national celebrity. And they, the town named uh, the elementary school after him, Liberty Hyde Bailey Elementary School, which I attended as a little boy. 
was just a two blocks away from my house. And actually, I later lived on Bailey Street when I was in college. It happened to be a street that had inexpensive housing. So I ended up living on Bailey Street for a couple of years. So Bailey actually had an impact on me early on. And back at the time, they actually always kept a, a, a garden in the playground. And I think it was in recognition of Liberty Hyde Bailey. They would start a garden and teach us about plants and so forth. So another big uh, inspiration for me was this other professor going back to the 1800s, 1880s. Uh, and this is William Beale. He was also a botanist, very in influential at Michigan State. He hired Liberty Hyde Bailey <laughs> at Michigan State. But uh, the important thing for me was that he started this incredible botanical garden that still exists on campus. And growing up, my brothers and I would just spend hours in these gardens learning the plant names and the characteristics. And my younger brother went on to get his uh, PhD in botany at UC Berkeley. <laughs> And of course, I went a little bit different direction into plant microbe interactions. So that, that was, a, I think, a formative time for me when I was young and maybe didn't even quite know it. Another more uh, time that I am aware of was what uh, Alan alluded to, and that is when I had the opportunity to spend time in Malawi. And this was as part of my master's research at Michigan State. I was working on a USAID project focused on bean cowpea improvement in Malawi and also in Zimbabwe and uh, in Mozambique time. And uh, my part of the project was to make a collection of all these different uh, bean land races throughout the northern part of, of Malawi and spent a couple of months traveling there. We were assigned our own Land Rover, a translator, a driver. It was great. And so we traveled all through the north. I collected this whole uh, Variety, and then we brought them back to the Boonda College farm where we planted them out and phenotyped them for things like yield and seed traits, and also in some cases for disease resistance. So the connection to what I'm, I'm ended up working on is that when I was in Malawi, it turned out there was a big outbreak of halo blight, and that's caused by Pseudomonas syringae fasciolicola. And this was really a devastating disease for small growers in uh, northern Malawi that year. It really wiped out their crop in many cases. And of course, they were surviving on that as a major source of protein. So that made a big impression on me. These two experiences, first of all, it made an impression on me about the natural variation in crops. I hadn't really understood how interesting and important that could be. And secondly, of course, about diseases. So that led me in, in my career then to really focus on these two questions, and that is, how do pathogens cause disease on plants, and why are some plants naturally resistant? And you can see both these plants have been inoculated with Pseudomonas syringae path of our tomato. The one on the right is showing no symptoms whatsoever about, uh, I think it's about a week after inoculating them. So with that background, what I'm going to tell you about today is just three topics. It's a rather focused talk. I'm going to introduce bacterial spec disease as an experimental model system. And then I'll talk a little kind of a little historical thing about the identification of PTO, the molecular basis, as Alan mentioned, of gene for gene interaction, leading into more recent terminology of vector triggered immunity. And then pose the question why did PTO evolve? Why did this resistance gene evolve? And that comes down to the fact that AVR PTO and AVR PTO B, two effectors, interfere with the immune system. So the, to introduce the system we've worked on then for about 30 years is just the interaction of tomato with Pseudomonas syringae, path of our tomato. It's a, uh, it can be a chronic disease throughout the world where tomato is grown in cool, moist climates. And you can see it's typified by these small necrotic lesions that form on, on leaves, but they also form on, on the flowers and clearly they can form on the fruits. And when they form on the fruit, um, it's decreases marketability, of course, for the farmer. But um, they can also, when the disease is severe, can actually defoliate the plant and also have a major impact on yield. Um, it, uh, we were just talking to Bill about this before the talk here. In 2015, there was actually outbreaks of bacterial spec across New York, from Long Island, all, the, all across uh, uh, New York. And Chris Smart collected many of these isolates, and, and we worked on those. So, after, I guess, what, 20 some years working on it here, it actually, the disease did become a problem even here in New York. So it's an economically important disease. It also has turned out to be a great model system. And that is for understanding bacterial pathogenesis and plant immunity. 
So I had no idea when I really started working on this interaction that it turns out Cornell is the best place in the world to work on Pseudomonas serenis, Bath Bar Tomato. And this is largely uh, due to the leadership of, of Alan over many, many years, who really nucleated this large group of people. Many of them you can see are off campus, but also the USDA here, certainly my lab at BTI and, and many other researchers all across the campus. Uh, just an amazing collaborative multidisciplinary team that was assembled here over the years. And it just you know, turned out to be the best place in the world that you could hope to work on this particular pathogen. So the advantages of Pseudomonas syringae are that it is a pathogen of tomato, but also of Nicotiana benthamiana, another model, as well as Arabidopsis. Um, it's easy to manipulate in the lab, and it's very easy to inoculate on plants. And as I showed, you get very nice symptoms uh, that you can uh, document. You can measure bacterial populations in leaves. There now, because of the uh, leadership, really, again, of Alan, there are a lot of uh, genome sequences. Alan was the PI on three consecutive NSF plant genome grants that uh, first generated the sequence of the type strain DC3000, but also generated lots of resources, mutants and all sorts of different experimental resources for, for the whole community, of course, not just here for Cornell. Uh, so, Alan's work discovered that uh, DC3000 has 36 type 3 effectors, and Alan's lab made many different mutant strains that are useful, and we're sending them out all the time. We just got a request the other day for more mutants that uh, Alan's lab generated. And then, of course, the real advantage, like I was mentioning, is that there's just were a lot of colleagues, a lot of experimental and web-based resources that have made this really a, a powerful model on the pathogen side. So those of you who have been here for a while know that it turns out Cornell is also the best place in the world to work on tomato. And this uh, largely, you know, of course, was instigated by Steve Tanksley back in the sort of the, the mid 1980s and his close interactions with Danny Zamir and with, with Charlie Rick um, brought that whole community here to Cornell. And you can see all the different folks here still on campus. Um, that have made uh, this the best place you could hope to work on this uh, crop. There's lots of people with lots of different expertise. So the advantages of tomato then is that it is intercrossable with 12 wild relatives. And that allows you to access all the uh, genetic diversity that's present in all those different relatives, including resistance genes. Uh, work from Steve's lab, of course, uh, developed a lot of genetic linkage maps, high density genetic linkage maps. Uh, work from Jim Giovannoni and many others, of course, have ex uh, generated an excellent uh, genome sequence. This was published in 2012 there in Nature. Um, and again, there's just many colleagues, experimental and web-based resources here available on campus and people to interact with. And of course, tomatoes are host for lots of different pathogens. So with that, that background, I'll, I'll move on to sort of a little bit of a historical thing, and that is identification of PTO and what we learned about its, uh, its role in gene-for-gene -gene interactions. So Alan again alluded, alluded to this fact that this was sort of the view of things when I took plant pathology, like in mid-1980s. But of course, Harold Floor had generated this idea back in the 1940s. But it's such a durable model, even to this day, that it still is you know, fundamental to this field. And the idea is that for each gene controlling resistance in the host, there is a corresponding gene controlling pathogenicity in the, in the pathogen. And the way that played out is that if there is a, there is a particular a plant with an R gene and a corresponding avirulence gene in the, in the pathogen, the result is resistance. If a R gene is lacking or an AVR gene is lacking in this specific interaction, the, the result in all cases is susceptibility. And one of the manifestations of, of resistance then is this immunity-associated cell death, also referred to as the hypersensitive response, as well as a lot of other defense responses. But uh, easy to score kind of macroscopic response is the uh, hypersensitive response uh, that's generated when there is a resistance reaction. So this is the way it applies then to the, the tomato system. So in uh, 1980, two uh, Canadian tomato breeders identified the PTO locus in their breeding program. Turns out it comes from a wild relative of tomato, Solanum pimpinella folium. 
Uh, so PTO, the locus itself was identified in 1980. Uh, AVR PTO, the avirulence uh, protein gene from Pseudomonas syringae was identified in 1992 by Pam Ronald and when she was a graduate student actually in Brian Staskowitz's lab. So the same principles apply here, that if the tomato uh, plant contains the PTO locus, and if a Pseudomonas swing, it contains AVR PTO, that is, if it's what's called a race zero strain, then we see resistance, and you can also see uh, indication of the hypersensitive response uh, in that little panel. In all other cases, we see susceptibility and, and no uh, hypersensitive response. And of course, this other race I mentioned, I think then is, is race one lacks AVR PTO. So in this system, there's only two known races, race zero or race one. So what made this advantageous back when I started working on this was that when I came to Steve Tanks' lab in 1989, was that there were these tomato near isogenic lines available. And they had been developed by John Watterson at, at Pedo Seeds, and he sent me seeds, and that was really the beginning of, of, the, of the project. What are these isogenic lines? So basically, it's a tomato variety called Rio Grande, into which he had introgressed the PTO locus, one small segment on chromosome five. The rest of the genomes and these two uh, lines were identical. So that's a really powerful tool because it allows you to identify markers that uh, fall within that small region near the PTO locus because of, of polymorphism. Another just sort of unusual, let me say, or serendipitous observation was, was this. And this was discovered in 1985 by Latero, a, a French uh, I believe he was a tomato breeder. He was trying to control for leaf miner in tomato. Sprayed it with this organophosphate uh, insecticide called Fenthion. And what he observed was that all of his lines that had the PTO gene responded almost like a hypersensitive response to Fenthion. And that, that was interesting for me at this point, basically for the utility of it. I could use it to easily screen populations. You could get fenthion, just spray it on, on plants, and they responded within a couple of days. So that became important for identifying PTO. So I mentioned in 1989 was the year I came to Steve Tanksley's lab. That was also the year, I came in May, and in August of 1989, the uh, gene responsible for cystic fibrosis was cloned from humans by Francis Collins's lab. Um, so a few uh, months after I came here, and what was uh, striking to me was that it was identified by map-based cloning. They did it by map-based cloning, or what they call at the time chromosome jumping. Um, so that, that struck me that there was this ability to be able to go into a genome and just identify an interesting gene, and, but none of the tools were available yet in plants, and certainly you know, not in tomato. So we launched this, this scheme that's identified, I'm not going to go through step by step, but a scheme of map-based cloning that uh, began with the idea of finding DNA markers that were closely linked to your gene of interest. And that was all done by RFLP mapping and, and Gillian remembers rapid mapping. Uh, this involved just milliseries of P32. I hate to even think back on it, but we did a lot of mapping. And the, the goal was to identify DNA markers that were residing very close to, to the gene of interest. And you know, it took a lot of work. This whole thing took about three years to go through. But we ended up finding markers that co-segregated with PTO. And then we can move on to the step two, which was doing a physical map and trying to understand what was the physical distance of the marker versus where the, the locus was. And ultimately, we developed a yeast artificial chromosome library that had these large segments, able to use a marker to find a segment that encompassed the locus, I think it was about 250 KB, and use that to find cDNA clones, and ultimately ended up with some candidates. And one of them, when we uh, put it under a 35S promoter and transformed it into a susceptible tomato line, conferred complete resistance to a race zero strain. And so that confirmed that it was actually the PTO gene. Um, and we came up with a new concept here. Instead of chromosome jumping or chromosome walking, we call it chromosome landing because we ended up landing right on one particular GAC clone. And this kind of concept has ended up being useful for a lot of plants that have large genomes. So it turned out that PTO and FEN, the other gene, are members of a cluster gene family and they encode cytoplasmic uh, protein kinases. 
Again, they were both pulled out of Solanum pipinellifolium. And uh, PTO was published in 93, and FEN was published in, in 1994. Um, these really were team efforts. I remember having many, many undergrads, even at the time, helping me pick yak clones in the Tanksy Library. So, I mean, it was a lot of people contributed to the cloning of these two genes. Uh, parallel work in Brian Stathkowitz's lab had shown that another gene, PRF, was also required for PTO and FEN function. And this is called PRF. And PRF, uh, of course, confers resistance to also the Pseudomonas syringae. Turns out that it encodes a nucleotide binding leucine rich repeat uh, protein of the large class that we now know of NLR proteins involved in many, many different uh, gene for gene interactions. And what was interesting was that PRF lies right in the middle of the cluster of this gene family, suggesting that this whole cluster uh, co evolved. So the models for gene for gene recognition back in the late teen, uh, 1980s were pretty rudimentary. Uh, this was, a, I took it from a review from Chris Lamb from Cell, made a few little modifications here, but the basic idea was that nobody had a clue, right? How the gene for gene interactions were working. So there was this idea that maybe there were some sort of elicitors that were being secreted from the from the pathogen and that maybe there were these extracellular receptors that might be detecting them, um, but really just kind of a lot of arrows and different, you know, <laughs> icons and things like not, not really any deep insight into what was going on. So of course the puzzle was that PTO and PRF turned out to be intracellular proteins. No indication that there was any extracellular domain or that there'd be any of this sort of recognition outside of the plant cell. So that, even in that early time started to, I think, suggest that PTO may detect AVR PTO inside the plant cell. And so to test this, we, we used this method, agroinfiltration. I think this was actually the first use of agroinfiltration where we had a tobacco line that was expressing PTO under 35S promoter. And then we developed an agrobacterium strain with AVR PTO under 35S promoter and just used syringe infiltration to infiltrate a leaf, uh, transiently transform it. So the tDNA would go into the plant cell, as is shown there. So you have AVR PTO and PTO in the same cell. And sure enough, what we observed was immunity associated cell death, indicating that PTO is detecting uh, AVR PTO inside the plant cell. And this was really nice work from Jamie Cho, Xiaoyan Tang, and uh, Reed Frederick, my first uh, three postdocs that were in the lab. So the, the further surprise, though, was that it turned out AVR PTO and PTO physically interact. And again, I'm not going to go into all the details here, but we used a yeast 2 hybrid uh, assay to be a, PTO as a bait and AVR uh, PTO as a prey to show uh, down here in the bottom right that AVR PTO and PTO, when they're expressed in the same yeast cell, activate LAC-Z, indicating that they're physically interacting. Notice that AVR PTO does not interact with FEN. Come back to that a little bit later. So this was uh, you know, sort of a demonstration then, right, of gene for gene, or in this case, protein-protein interaction that was underlying the basis. So at this stage, we had uh, this idea that uh, and I should say in 1996, many different papers reported that type 3 effectors are recognized in the plant cell. An early paper from Allen's lab, many other papers came out this year, along with uh, understanding of the type 3 secretion system, led to this idea that the pathogen is translocating effector proteins into the plant cell where they're able to uh, be recognized by our proteins. And I really like this quote from a review last year from Allen and from uh, Brian Kavitko that said, this opened up the vast world of interorganismal molecular interactions within plant cells. And it really did, a whole new world of, of interorganismal interactions. So uh, we still have some puzzles here. It turned out that uh, when Pam Rauner cloned AVR PTO, uh, knocked it out, made a mutation in AVR PTO and DC3000, unexpectedly, that strain was still recognized by PTO. And she knew there was only a single copy of AVR PTO. So it led to this idea that maybe there was another type 3 effector protein that's being recognized by PTO. And to find this, we, uh, young Jin Kim, a postdoc in the lab, set up what we call a cross-kingdom yeast 2 hybrid screen. 
where he made libraries of DC3000 genome fragments, introduced them into yeast that had PTO as a bait, and uh, looked for uh, pseudomonas proteins that would interact with uh, PTO. And what he found was what we now call ABRPTOB. And uh, this, so now we have two distinct pseudomonas effector proteins that both interact with the PTO kinase. He showed that ABRPTOB could interact with PTO, um, but it, again, does not interact with FEN, and expressed it with agroinfiltration to show that it gave a hypersensitive response. Turns out that AVRPTOB and AVRPTO have no structural similarity at all. And we have structure from working with Gigi Chai and also with Lyndon Nicholson of the two effector proteins. This is just showing that the domain of each effector protein that interacts with PTO, um, completely different uh, uh, structures. Um, it turns out, though, that if you make a, a DC3000 double mutant, knock out both the effectors, that is no longer recognized by PTO. So this is the only other effector that is known. And I, I don't think I have time to go into all the details here, but it turns out that both effectors are multi-domain proteins with each domain having a distinct function. And over the years, we've learned a lot about how these different domains, you can see the PTO interaction domain and ABRPTOB, of course, interact with PTO and then with uh, PRF. We, uh, another domain interacts with PTO and with FEN, but only if the C-terminal domain is missing. And then we've also discovered over the years that there's a lot of uh, post-translational modifications that occur to both of these vector proteins. So how do they actually interact with PTO? And this came from, again, a collaboration with Gigi Chai, who generated co-crystal structures of PTO interacting with AVRPTO or with AVRPTOB. And this shows a superimposition of, of, all, of both of these different co-crystal structures. And what was interesting about this was that they have a common interface. There's one part of it, the P plus one loop, that they both share this one interface of interacting with PTO, but each of them has a distinct interface, a, a, a unique or distinct interface. And Kathy Monkball, the postdoc in the lab uh, at the time, did some functional analysis to verify this structure. So this was interesting to us because it raised the possibility that PTO actually evolved in maybe a stepwise fashion it first maybe learned to recognize one effector protein, and then over time evolved to recognize another effector protein. So this is a case where we went back and took advantage of the wild relatives of tomato. And we screened a number of different accessions asking this question, is there uh, AVR PTO or AVR PTO B specific recognition? And it turned out that um, you can see there in red, we found 28 accessions that only recognized AVRPTOB, three that only recognized AVRPTO, four that recognized both, and then there were many that, of course, didn't recognize either effector. All 28 of these that recognized only AVRPTOB came from the same species, Solanum chimaluskii, and that's endemic to this small region of the uh, Indian highlands of, of Peru, so a very small uh, region. And uh, Christine Krauss, graduate student in the lab, characterized this and turned out, yeah, it was basically the PTO family member that had certain uh, amino acid substitutions, in fact, just two amino acid substitutions that allowed it to recognize only uh, AVRPTOB, but not uh, AVRPTO. So I had an opportunity then to uh, visit this region in Peru with uh, graduate student Andre Velasquez. And our goal there was to identify uh, more accessions of Solana chimaluskii, and we were hoping also to be able to collect isolates of Pseudomonas syringi there to see, did they have AVRPTOB? And it was a tremendous trip. We spent a couple of weeks there. We found many different accessions of Solana chimaluskii, but uh, unfortunately, we were never able to get the permits to take things out of the country. So that, that project never went further than that, but it was really, interesting trip to be able to go down there and see tomato in the wild. So this left us with this sort of model then a little bit more developed where we have uh, AVRPTO or AVRPTOB getting translocated and, and being recognized by PTO. And then that raised the question, what happens after recognition? And we spent maybe 20, 25 years using many different methods, virus-induced gene silencing, 
RNA-seq, yeast two hybrid screens, MAP-based cloning, more recently CRISPR, to try to understand what are all these events that are occurring after recognition. And we made uh, you know, some progress. And this shows work from all these different uh, uh, postdocs in this case on this particular question. I'll make uh, just three points for this slide. One is that we uh, discovered the central role of a MAP kinase cascade. And this was really following on some early work from Dan's lab, where he identified uh, MAP kinases as being important in immunity. They turn out to be uh, important in the PTO-PRF pathway. And we've identified a number of different proteins that work in concert with that MAP kinase cascade as part of a, a effective triggered immunity. Uh, more recently, there's been this new category of NLR proteins called, uh, referred to as helper proteins. And Ning Zhang in the lab published a paper just earlier this year showing that these helper proteins act upstream of MAP kinase, uh, of the MAP kinase cascade and codependently with PRF. And so it's still not clear exactly how PRF and these uh, helper proteins are interacting with each other. We know now from the structural work from Gigi Chai and others that uh, many of the NLRs are forming these calcium type channels, resistance zones. And so it's interesting that uh, Olga Del Pozo uh, about 10 years ago had identified a calcium sensor signaling module. And we're very intrigued now by the possibility that this might be the next step of being able to decode the calcium signal that comes in through the resistance zone might be able to be identified by this uh, calcium sensor. Okay, so I'm gonna finish up here with this uh, last question, and that is why did PTO evolve? And this now is a little bit different than what I talked about when we made this uh, double mutant. In this case, we put it onto a plant that does not have PRF. So this is a, it has a non-functional PTO pathway. We're just looking at virulence. Okay, not looking at recognition. And what uh, uh, Nai Chun Lin, graduate student in our department here in my lab, found is that you could uh, make a mutation in either AVR PTO or an AVR PTO B, and it really didn't have a big impact on its virulence. It still produced about the same disease symptoms, same number of specs, same bacterial populations. But if you made a double mutant, knocked out both of these genes, there was a significant decrease in virulence. So that established, and this was a, a term that Allen's lab came up with, redundant effector group. This then sort of represents this kind of case where there's two different effectors that have some sort of functional redundancy, even though, again, they have no uh, structural similarity. So to tell you about uh, how ABRPTO and ABRPTO-B promote virulence, I'll show just one slide about a lot of parallel work that went on about pattern triggered immunity in my lab, haven't had time to go into. But we now know that there are a number of different extracellular receptors that are involved in so-called pattern triggered immunity, recognizing a microbe associated molecular patterns. One of these we cloned in my lab, FLS3. Of course, FLS2 was originally identified in Arabidopsis. Core is a, this cold shock protein receptor was identified by a, a different group. And my lab identified BTI9 and WAC1. But we have a number of different uh, uh, what we call pattern recognition receptors. We know something about their identity. And we've started to uh, work out what happens afterwards. What are the downstream signaling events with these? And in particular, I'll mention one uh, current project going on in the lab is to understand what is the role of protein phosphatases, PP2Cs, and negatively, seems like in most cases, negatively regulating. Uh, PTI signaling. And this is a result of a longstanding collaboration that I had with uh, Guido Sessa, who tragically died last year in the middle of, of last year. But this is an ongoing uh, BARD project that uh, postdoc Fan Jia is now working on. So what did we learn? Turns out that AVRPTO B and AVRPTO interfere with pattern uh, triggered immunity. Basically, this is a schematic of these proteins again, but they interact, these both affected proteins interact with the kinase domains of these pattern recognition receptors. Okay, so they both block FLS2 and FLS3 signaling. Um, AVRPTOB also interacts with BTI9 and it inhibits its kinase activity. 
And so what's interesting is that PTO and FEN have evolved to specifically recognize exactly these same domains that are promoting virulence. So the pathogen can't easily get around recognition by PTO and FEN. They've zeroed in on exactly the same residues that are needed for virulence. So of course, this suggests that PTO and FEN evolved as decoys. That's the way we prefer to think of it. They have evolved as decoys of these kinase, kinase domains. Uh, mimicking the kinase domains and then activating effector triggered immunity. So what is the role of that C-terminal domain of AVRPTOB that we, I referred to earlier? This was a result of uh, a lot of thinking and different functional character characterization that showed that that was important. And again, I, I'm skipping a lot of details here, but we collaborated with an X-ray crystallographer, Eric Stebbins at Rockefeller University, who generated a crystal structure of the AVRPTOB C terminal domain and showed that it was a uh, eukaryotic, it mimicked a eukaryotic U box E3 ubiquitin ligase. And that was really interesting an example where a prokaryotic protein is really a clear mimic of a, of a eukaryotic protein. Of course, it's interacting in a eukaryotic cell. That's where it's, it's doing its function. This was work that was spearheaded by Rob Abramovich, also a graduate student uh, in our lab. And again, I, I won't go into a lot of details, but Tracy Rosebrock, another graduate student in the lab, and Johannes Matthew, a postdoc, showed that what the mechanism was is that this E3 ubiquitin ligase was able to ubiquitinate either PTO or FEN if they were bound to this in, internal domain, that FID domain. And if they were ubiquitinated, it caused the degradation of those proteins. But this ubiquitination activity was not able to act on PTO we call it because it, it was too far away, basically a proximity model. It was not uh, uh, close enough to the E3 ubiquitin ligase. So all of these uh, data that I've shown you, it, it's kind of nice in the end, they can all be integrated into a sort of simple model. And this was originally put forth by Jeff Dangle and, and Jonathan Jones as the zigzag model. Um, but we like to think we've added a few more zigzags to it. And I'll show you what I mean. So this, we have this dotted line is a threshold for pattern triggered immunity or the threshold for effector triggered immunity. And the idea of that is that pattern recognition receptors are able to recognize microbe associated patterns and activate pattern triggered immunity. But certain effectors, and I've shown you in our case, AVRPTOB, the N-terminal domain or AVRPTO are able to interfere with pattern triggered immunity called effector-mediated virulence suppression of PTI, and then the result is plant disease susceptibility. So in this model, we then we postulate this idea that FEN was potentially the first R gene to evolve. And its protein uh, is able to uh, bind to AVRPTOB, to this N-terminal domain, and to activate effector-triggered immunity, but that E3 ligase came into the picture. Somewhere this E3 uh, ligase domain was acquired, became fused to AVR uh, PTOB. That's able to degrade FEN and what we call now confer effector mediated pathogenicity. And we're back again to disease susceptibility. But then again, we would hypothesize that PTO evolved. And PTO is able to resist the ubiquitination. It can recognize AVR PTOB either full length or the truncated form. And of course, it can also recognize AVR PTO. And I'll just mention PTO has turned out to be a fairly durable resistance gene. It's been in use since I think the mid 1980s, and it's still uh, widely used around the world. It has some durability, probably because it's able to recognize these two really important uh, virulence components. So I'll end on just these outstanding questions. Of course, there's a lot of them, but these are things I'd work on in the next 10 years if I was going to stay here uh, 10 years. That is the PRF structure. Is it going to be a pentamere-like uh, calcium channel? That seems likely, but uh, PRF has this very large and terminal domain and the sole domain, quite different from ZAR1, the other, uh, other structures have come from. So. There's something else probably going to go on with the biology here with PRF that's uh, unique compared to others. How does PRF associate with these helper proteins, NRC2 and 3? I think that's really going to be an interesting question. It gets us one more step 
down the uh, signaling pathway in ETI. Um, I'm interested in this idea I mentioned, do SIP uh, K6 and, and CBL10, do they perhaps play a role in decoding the calcium signal coming from the resistosome? Are BTI9 and, and WAC1, uh, are they actually pattern recognition receptors? We don't really know what ligands they might recognize. And then what is the role of uh, protein phosphatase 2Cs? I think they're emerging as having a really important role in, in regulating uh, PTI and probably uh, ETI as well. So I uh, end by uh, thanking all the collaborators I've had. I mean, the work I talked about, most of it couldn't have been done without lots of different collaborations here at, uh, at BTI, here at Cornell, and of course, uh, collaborators in the USDA ARS and at many other institutions. And then I'm not going to have time to recognize everybody individually, but I'd like to acknowledge the work. 16 different graduate students that I've had that, you know, contributed in many different ways. Uh, postdocs over the years, going back to 1992, uh, uh, many different postdocs. Um, Alan mentioned I had many undergraduates going back to Purdue. I had over 102. <laughs> I, they're not all shown here, of course. And then other uh, lab techs, lab managers, and research specialists. And I'll end by uh, recognizing the funding source. Over the years, we had money from NIH, from USDA, the Triad Foundation, NSF, uh, BARD, and uh, more recently from USAID. Thank you very much for coming. Questions? Oh, come on. <laughs> well, maybe up in, I don't know, in Geneva or something. Sure. Yeah. I'm getting more interested in the BB2Cs too. Can you tell me like a little bit more about that or what you're, you're excited about in that? Yeah, we um, we um, were looking at a, a protein kinase that interacts with a PRR uh, by doing mass spec IP and mass spec, and we identified a PP2C. This was some years ago, and so then that that kind of you know tuned us in on that idea that might be important. We ended up going back to RNA seq data and identifying of the 92 PP2Cs that are present in tomato that there were just 11 whose gene is induced during the immune response. So that allowed us to narrow it down to a smaller set. And we've made a CRISPR mutant now in all of those. And we have four so far that have an interesting phenotype. So, you know, we kind of used RNA-seq to get back into what might be the important ones. And if you're interested, we have tomato mutants okay. available. Thank you. 14 <laughs> different ones. Dan? Who is continuing your excellent work? Ning, right here. Just <laughs> accepted a faculty position at uh, James Madison University. She'll continue with a lot of the CRISPR lines. And uh, I, you know, other former lab members are continuing some aspects of it, too. Yeah. Gosh? So you mentioned that this can infect the fruit as well. If I remember correctly, your yeah. introduction, do the same genetic mechanisms of resistance apply to the fruits as well? Yeah, that's a good question. We we haven't looked at it specifically, but if the line has PTO, you don't see specs form on the fruits. So presumably it is being expressed and effective in the fruits as well. Yes, I have a question, and that is we've also worked over the years a, a bit on uh, strains of, of Serini that have a different effective repertoire and don't have functional AVR PTO or PTO or uh, maybe our PTOB. And has there been any new insights into how they are performing that basic function in a sense that, that yeah. the function of suppressing uh, flagellar? Says, uh, yeah, that's a good point. So so there are pseudomonas stringy strains that don't have AVR PTO or AVR PTOB. Those are the race one strains. And um, what we know about that is that there is another effector that can be recognized. The, the effector is AVR-RPT2. Some of you will remember that from 30 years ago. So AVR-RPT2 might be playing that. It also has an important virulence contribution. And we've identified the R gene in tomato that recognizes AVR-RPT2. So that might be part of the answer to, to what replaces the virulence. But I've always been interested in that. And I don't, I don't think we have a good answer for it. OK. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the AVRPDOP evolved the part that's similar to the eukaryotic um, uh, Is there any evidence 
in the disease result in genome that there might be a precursor protein to that? Yeah, that's a good question. There isn't. Yeah, it's not clear where, where it came from. We've searched all different genomes with that little fragment, and whenever we find it, it is basically attached to AVRPTOB. But we have examples where we have AVRPTOB without the E3 ligase. So you, you do have the trunk, you kind of have my, what we think would be the progenitor, you know, the truncated, but we don't, we can't find any other evidence of where it came from. You know, presumably horizontal gene transfer from something, but, but we don't know what. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm actually just thinking a little bit about the evolution, like your evolutionary scenario of PTO and the FEN, or FEN PTO, and the fact that they're clustered in the genome. Um, coming from fungi, we see metabolite clusters that are co-regulated, and I'm just curious if what's known about the regulation of those. Is there epigenetic evidence for? Yeah. I can't say anything about. No, yeah, I can't say anything about the epigenetics in terms of just the expression. Um, all, all of the uh, family members, as well as PRF, are really constitutively expressed at a low level. And that kind of goes for most NLR genes. They're usually expressed at a relatively uh, low level. So there's not like big induction during the immune response. And of course, the cluster gene family probably just came from gene duplication over time. In this case, they're all, I should say, they're all protein kinases without any introns. So it's sort of easy to envision. Uh, duplication occurring. <clears throat> Gillian. How broadly applicable is your model? Well, I mean, that, that model I showed of the zigzag is really broadly applicable to gene for gene interactions and the way pattern triggered immunity works and, and the ETI works. Um, I mean, there are other examples where uh, type 3 effectors are also able to undermine or interfere with ETI. So that, that part of the model is also has some universality to it. The first part of it is very common, you know, suppressing PTI. Okay, well, if there are no Great. further Thank you. questions, thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.